Fairfax, Virginia, she sees a lot of our uh, uh, birds, um, the good, bad, and ugly. And so we're so glad that she's there permanently now. She's one of our favorites. And this is her second time to be with us as a speaker. Thank you for that. And um, if you do decide to come to the retreat, she's also coming to the retreat as an attendee. So what a great time to spend with people like her, you know, that you don't get to do in a day-to-day, -day, like, you know, office visit or whatever. It's just a great opportunity. So um, once again, I, I can't say enough about it. I really hope you'll join us for the retreat if you can. And so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Carruthers. Thank you for taking on this topic. We have so many birds that get into trouble, you know, and it's always on a Sunday night, right? So right. It's always on a Sunday night. It's always when we're closed. Always when you exactly. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to uh, all your good advice and we'll meet up again uh, at the end. So I'm going to go offline now and let you take it away. Sounds good. All right. Let me see here. There we go. All right. So hi, everyone. Like, um, like Ann said, I'm Dr. Carruthers. I, um, I've been at Stalls um, in Fairfax, Virginia for about five years now. I finished my avian residency a little over a year ago. And um, during my time as an avian resident, one of the most meaningful things I did was make a presentation for Phoenix Landing. So I was very, very honored and excited when Anne asked me to come back, but a little bit daunted when she asked me to do things that break because man, there is a lot of things that birds can injure on themselves. Um, so I tried to kind of make it as distinct as possible and make it useful information for you guys, but also things that you might find interesting um, that you don't necessarily get to see that happen in the treatment room. So just as a little layout, um, what we're gonna go through today, we're gonna talk about how to, we're gonna start by talking about how to kind of assess our home for dangers and things that can cause traumatic injuries in birds and things that can cause some of these things to break. We're also gonna talk about things that I recommend at home to keep on hand. That's really important for building your own first aid kit, but also things that maybe don't fit inside that cute first aid kit box that you also wanna keep on hand. And then we're gonna go through a couple of different things that I see that break on birds on a very regular basis. So that includes blood feathers, nails, beaks, skin, toes. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about constrictive injuries of toes and feet, um, and then bones as well is where we're gonna finish. So, so starting with environmental dangers. Um, so the most important thing to keep in mind here is that I'm not expecting that we're all going to eliminate every environmental danger in our home. Um, I'm just gonna go through some things that I see a lot because the, we just wanna be aware. Um, we're not gonna ever necessarily mitigate or eliminate all these. We wanna just be able to mediate them. Um, so common injuries and things I see um, due to things at home. Um, so birds, other birds in the home, um, when they get in fights or just play a little bit too aggressively, we can see injuries between birds. Um, things like ceiling fans um, and mirrors and glass doors. We often see collision injuries. Um, very rarely do I see thermal burns, but occasionally I do. Um, I unfortunately, and it happens easily and I never, you know, I, I get it, but I sometimes do see birds that come in that have been stepped on. And of course, injuries from other pets in the home that aren't necessarily other birds, but animals like cats and dogs. Um, so, um, so things that you can keep in your at home to build your own first aid kit. I really recommend keeping a gram scale. Um, I also recommend weighing our birds regularly at home, ideally about once a month, maybe even more frequently, especially if your bird has a known illness, because oftentimes um, one of the very first signs of an ill bird is that they begin to lose weight. So maybe not directly things that break, but things I recommend keeping. I do recommend having on hand towels for restraint and latex gloves to prevent any bacteria from our hands from getting into wounds, things like that. Gauze sponges and Q-tips can be really helpful for, um, you know, manipulating that very, very difficult skin. So can tweezers or forceps. Nail trimmers can be really helpful when you need to kind of remove a little bit of a nail that has been broken off um, so it doesn't get caught on anything. Um, things like sterile saline and flush is great for um, for small wounds to try to decontaminate them. Um, I'll rec now we'll talk about why I don't necessarily recommend hydrogen peroxide and things like that. Um, I also recommend having on hand a styptic powder. I use Quick Stop at our practice. 
um, but you can also get styptic pencils in case there is something, um, an injury like a nail or a beak or a blood feather that's bleeding. Um, I like Quick Stop because it contains benzocaine in it, which is an anesthetic agent. So it also numbs the area. But if you don't have styptic powder or want to use something you have on hand at home, cornstarch is a great alternative and so is flour. I do like rec recommending having a water-based lubricant to cover any wounds um, and keep them moist, um, keep the tissue healthy and alive. And then as far as antimicrobials and wound dressings that are easy to take a cab at home, um, silver sulfadiazine is typically available over the counter. Um, it's antimicrobial and really hydrating. Um, I also really love um, uh, hydrogel ointments like the Vetrisin. So those are some things I recommend having at home. Um, I also recommend having a copy of your bird's medical records, especially if you do need to go to a um, emergency clinic overnight that is not your primary veterinarian. I also recommend having a phone number and having a backup plan in case your primary avian veterinarian is not available. So having a plan, having a phone number available for an ER veterinarian. Um, and then I also recommend having this number um, handy. I put it in bold and highlighted it for you. So if you want to write it down, please go ahead. But it's the phone number for the Pet Poison um, Helpline. So not necessarily things that break, but this is really helpful for if your bird eats something and you're not sure if this is something where we need to go to the vet or it's something where, you know, this is toxic or how much of my bird ate this is toxic. This is a great number to call. I will say it does have an $85 one-time fee, um, but it's really helpful. And often if you're calling my practice, if you're calling or receptionists are going to tell you to go ahead and call them because it really helps me to have the case number that they create. And then I call them with your case number and then they can tell me what the best um, plan of action is moving forward um, based on the dose that your bird got. So um, I also, one of the most important things that I recommend having at home that is very important when we're talking about injuries and things that break in birds is a hospital type setup. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is a flat footed enclosure with a heat source. So um, you can see this bird right here is in a large sterile -like container that works really, really well for our big parrots like our um, cockatoos like this kiddo, but it can also even fit large macaws. Um, so how we create these what works really well for small birds is actually like a 20 to 40 gallon glass aquarium. Um, so we want to make sure we're using something that is not our bird's normal cage because most of our birds have cages that they can climb the sides of really easily. And we want to make sure the sides are smooth because that prevents the bird from using excessive amounts of injury or energy climbing and clinging to the sides. Um, so that's why just taking the perches isn't necessarily going to, uh, taking the perches out of your um, bird's normal cage won't necessarily work. They're still going to be climbing and clinging to the sides and can cause more injury um, to or an already existing injury. So that flat hospital type setup prevents that. Um, for large birds, a large stair like container, like that previous picture with our cockatoo works great. And it can even fit, if you get a large enough one, it can even fit large macaws. But as you saw in that last picture, it is very important to drill holes into that enclosure to create good ventilation. On the bod, oh, I'm sorry, for heat, um, we do want to keep it pretty warm. Um, when birds are sick, they often become fluffed, and that's a sign they can't thermoregulate. So I aim for around 80 to 85 degrees is what's recommended. You can use an under the tank heating pad. If you go to your pet store, like your local um, pet store, these are often in the reptile section. Um, they can be plugged into what's something called a rheostat and the temperature can be adjusted, but you can also monitor the temperature with things like infrared heat guns, um, as well as um, like digital thermometer probes. I don't recommend using dials, um, the, the little plastic dials that stick on because they can be pretty inaccurate. Um, you can also use on these aquariums um, for your smaller birds, things like overhead um, ceram or over tank ceramic heat emitters. You, those can get really, really hot. Some of these reptiles need a lot of heat. Again, most of these are designed for reptiles, but you can use them on birds. I would use a lower wattage one. 30 watts is probably fine. Um, on the bottom of the tank, I recommend using something that isn't a normal terry cloth towel because the nails on your bird can snag on those terry cloth towels. Instead, using paper towels, or if you need a little bit more padding, you can use that terry cloth towel, but put a pillowcase over it because that's nice and smooth and won't cause any snagging of the nails. 
Um, we do want to remove anything a bird can perch on. So I typically don't recommend having um, a large food dish because they'll often try to perch on that. So sometimes I'll just put whatever the diet is directly on the bottom of that tank and a bird can just kind of eat right off the ground. Um, but I do find that a lot of birds get really anxious when they can't perch. And if that's the case, you can create your own perch by um, rolling up a towel um, into kind of like a little uh, a little cylinder and putting that down and that's soft and low to the ground. What's in this picture is a piece of PVC pipe that's been wrapped in um, bandage wrap and attached to some tongue depressors. And that works too, but I feel like a rolled towel is probably something you can you know make at home with supplies you already have. Um, but the PVC pipe tip situation is probably a bit more stable. Um, we want to remember that a home incubator is not necessarily hospitalization. So um, keep in mind that uh, when your bird is hospitalized, it is heat support and um, cage modification, but it is also nutritional support, fluid support, and also injectable medications I that I can't necessarily send um, you guys home with. So sometimes hospitalization is what's appropriate, and we'll talk about when that's the case. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about that breaks is blood feathers. So in case you're not familiar, when feathers are growing, each individual feather has their own blood supply. Um, the base where the feather is developing on these blood feathers is typically a very dark blue color. And when small, when these small blood feathers break, it's usually not a big deal, but when larger blood feathers break, like those on the wings or on the tail, they can bleed quite a bit and birds can lose a fair amount of blood. Um, so, once that feather is fully grown though, that blood supply is lost and the feather is just a dead unit of skin, just like hair or fur on, a, on another dog or pet. Um, but like I mentioned, when they're damaged, they can bleed quite heavily. So in order to stop the bleeding, that feather often needs to be removed. There are some things you can do at home that I'll talk about, but blood feather removal, typically I recommend having done by a veterinarian um, because for a couple of reasons. One, um, pain medication, having a blood feather removed is painful. Um, the flight feathers are usually, you know, are very closely attached to the periosteum or the lining of the bone. Um, so this definitely is something that I like to give birds some pain medication for, either um, some non-steroidals like meloxicam or even an opioid. Um, it is a job that requires two people. As you see in this picture, one person needs to be able to restrain the bird um, and the other person needs to be the one that, you know, is extending the wing and removing that feather. Um, what we do is I apply a hemostat kind of just transversely to that blood feather, um, clamp down, and then in one very fast fluid motion, remove it. Um, we need to ensure that it's completely removed because if it's not, that feather will continue to bleed. Um, and then we want to hold pressure at the base. But even with removal, there is a risk of damage to that follicle and we have to be aware of that and it can lead to abnormal um, feather development. But there are some things you can do at home if you ever notice this happening. This picture is just a picture of what that blood a blood feather looks like. This one is perfectly intact, um, unlike our little sun conure in our previous image. Um, but this one is intact. This is what um, this was just a very long one because. Well, um, but the but this is just to show you what it looks like on the tail. But what you can do at home if you notice a broken blood feather is apply a little bit of warm water um, to identify which feather is the one that is bleeding. Um, then you can apply you you can apply some direct firm pressure, but something to be um, just something to be aware of is that when you're restraining your a bird for any reason, that's going to lead to increased blood pressure, which can prolong um, bleeding episodes and can kind of prolong you know. Um, that bleeding time and clotting time. Um, you can also um, apply things like the commercial quick stop products or cornstarch and flour, like I mentioned. Um, once we do get bleeding under control, especially if it's a um, especially if it's a feather on the wing, we want to make sure that we're keeping um, that bird from re to refraining from flapping its wings. Um, so keeping them in a dark, quiet environment is really helpful to kind of keep them calm, especially until we can figure out if we need to get to a veterinarian to have that removed. So moving on to the next topic, which is broken nails. Um, so nails uh, um, are, or claws, they can call them either one, cover the last bone. So it actually sits over the last bone of each digit. So very different than our nails. Um, they contain a blood supply known as the quick, which you are probably familiar with. 
Um, and broken nails can lead to things like excessive bleeding, um, pain, and even infection if it's not treated and cleaned appropriately. Typically, you have to remove the nail um, kind of, you have to remove the, that broken bit, and then you often can cauterize or use um, something like that quick stop product or silver nitrate at the base of it to stop the bleeding. At home, you can use the quick stop cornstarch um, or flour and manage to keep and try to keep them in a low stress environment. And one of my tips and tricks for this is if you have a bird with a broken nail at home, instead of restraining them, which is going to increase that blood pressure, you can actually have a small, a small box appropriately sized for your bird, pour the quick stop or cornstarch or flour at the bottom and then have them stand or walk in it. And that might be an easy, more low stress way to get that, um, that powder on the base of that bleeding nail. I forgot to mention this. So I am a veterinarian and I see um, some, um, some, pretty, some pretty broken birds. So in case anyone that's watching is not inclined to, um, to enjoy images of of you know broken birds <laughs> in case you're a little bit queasy I did give um I do have some warnings when graphic images are about to come up um so if you're one of those if you're someone that doesn't want to see that if you're not inclined to see those images if that's something that might be upsetting to you I absolutely understand here's a picture of a very adorable bird to keep in mind you can turn away close your eyes and just listen to my voice and I'll tell you when to tune back in so this is a picture of a nail avulsion. Um, so nail avulsions and nail breaks are a bit different. An avulsion is the pulling or tearing away of the nail from the rest of the toe. Um, this is often the result of excessive length, but it can also be due to trauma. In these instances, the nail is not going to regrow, at least in this, at least in this picture, because what's happening is you're losing that entire bone. You're losing the bone at the end of that digit. So that nail is going to, you know, continue that, that that's going to heal, but it's not, it can heal, but it's not going to heal with a normal nail that regrows, which is oftentimes fine. Those birds typically do well and it does not affect their ability to perch or grip, um, but just something to expect. It's a question I commonly get. Nail avulsions do require pain medication. As you can imagine, that does not feel good. It hurts. Um, I also recommend antibiotics for nail avulsions because you're, you are creating a, pay, a pretty big open wound. We, wanna, we oftentimes need to apply wound dressing and bandages. And unfortunately, a lot of these birds are inclined to chew at this toe because it does hurt. And so oftentimes I do need to place a collar um, on these kiddos to prevent them from chewing at that toe. I try not to, and I'll show you in, our, in one of our um, slides coming up how that looks. So this is a case we had at our clinic recently of a kiddo who had a nail avulsion. So on the far left of the screen, that's a toe that unfortunately the nail has avulsed. We took an x-ray and on this x-ray, you can actually see how that bone that's normally present, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm outlining it right here. That's the nail, the bone of the nail, um, that's on the healthy toe. And then this toe is the affected toe when you can see that we don't have that. So that nail is definitely not going to regrow. Here, um, we've cleaned that up as you saw in that first picture all the way over there. Um, there's some fiber attached to it. It looks like it's maybe not necessarily old, but definitely needed to be decontaminated and cleaned. So we've cleaned it up and maybe even applied a little bit of tissue glue to the end to kind of secure and kind of create some um, apposition of that skin. And then in the very far right picture, we have a picture of um, this kiddo wearing a ball bandage with those crazy tape tags on them. This is one of my tricks to try to, um, I like to try to avoid collars when I can. And I know you guys feel the same way. Birds can get very, very stressed in collars. And it's usually not something I take lightly when I collar a bird. Um, in fact, I usually recommend keeping them at hospital if I have to place a collar. But what I've done here is placed a pretty bulky bandage on that foot. And it doesn't work if it's just the toe because birds are too smart for that. And their beaks are way too agile. They're going to be able to remove that really easily. You typically do have to do a pretty bulky foot bandage to keep that, um, to keep them from getting at their foot. Um, that also provides a good amount of padding so that it doesn't hurt for them to stand on. Um, but I have these tape tabs here. We call these distractor tabs um, at work and it gives the bird something to chew on. It's literally just a piece of folded up tape stuck to the bandage so that he can go after those, but not actually go after his bandage. Unfortunately for this kiddo, that wasn't enough. And eventually we did have to place a collar. He was managing to get the bandage off, but for some birds that's enough to keep them distracted. 
All right, gross pictures of nails are done um, and we're moving on to beaks. And to understand beaks and beak trauma and beak breaks, we kind of have to understand a little bit of the anatomy. Um, people refer to beaks with a lot of different words. You can call it the beak, the bill, the rostrum. What it includes is the skeletal, the actual bone that's beneath the beak, um, the dermal tissue that lies above it, and then the epithelial or that thick keratin structure that we actually see that lies on top of it. The top beak is called the maxillary, maxillary beak or maxillary rostrum, and then the bottom beak is called the mandibular beak or the mandibular rostrum. The very, um, the very fancy name Ramphitheca refers to the keratinaceous or that kind of shell-like covering on the covering of the beak, and Ramphitheca refers to both the top and the bottom keratinaceous coverings. If you're just talking about the top keratinaceous covering, it's called the rhinotheca. Um, think about like rhinoceros, <laughs> you know, it's kind of on the top, it's near their nose. And then nathotheca, which is the mandibular or the bottom beak in that keratinaceous covering. The colman is the top curvature, the um, dorsal curvature of the beak, and the gonus is the ventral curvature of the beak. And then the tomium is that sharp cutting edge on either on the sides of the beak, can also be referred to kind of at the, the cutting edge of the front part of the beak as well. Um, these terms help us describe beak injuries and help us, you know, be able to communicate them, about them in a way that makes sense because the beak is a very unique and complicated structure. So we, as far as kind of um, more microanatomy, like I mentioned, the beak is bone with, uh, that is uh, that has dermis overlying it, um, which is overlied by a modified epidermis. Um, that dermis is very closely attached to the periosteum, which is the lining of the bone that contains blood supply. And the dermis contains a very robust blood supply and nerve supply itself. So this is in the American Journal of Veterinary Research. Um, these, um, the, they used contrast enhancing CT to identify the neurovascular structures within the beak. Um, and they really well visualized the dermal papilla, which are finger-like projections. Um, of that dermis that kind of dive deeper down into some of those keratin layers. And this is why beaks are, this is why beak trimming really ought to be done by someone who understands the anatomy of the beak, um, because even though we are trimming that keratin, um, we may not see it, but some of these nerves that you can see in these images dive pretty deep into that keratin, and they are very, very sensitive. Um, <clears throat> so, and then you have the keratinaceous layer, which is the modified epidermis, that arises from the dermis, um, and there are two types of keratin. There's the covering keratin, which is actually quite thin. Um, it covers the sides and the top. And then you have that pressure bearing keratin that is very, very strong, and it's on the occlusal surfaces or the parts that touch of the beak, as well as the tomia or the cutting edge of the beak. Um, and it's very, very strong if, because it contains calcium phosphate and hydroxyapatite crystals. So there's a couple of different ways that birds can break their beaks. Um, and there's a couple of, these are a couple of the things that I've personally seen. So one very, I just love this picture of these two birds because they do just kind of look like they're about to like gang up on you, you know? <laughs> um, but um, but it, the most, one of the most common things I see is from um, bites and wounds from other birds. When birds decide they're not happy, they often go for the face and the beak. Um, I also see a lot of things in cages that can sometimes cause beak injuries. I um, was just talking to Anne about this right before we started, but bell claspers actually, the little um, pieces of bells that um, are the clanging bits that attach to the top. If you look deep into that bell, um, you can see that it has an opening. And I've seen a couple of birds come in with beak punctures from having kind of, you know, gotten their beak up into that bell and kind of getting their beak stuck basically on that clasper. So we just need to be aware that those can be a problem. Um, birds can also sometimes ingest those if they're small enough, which causes other, obviously, GI issues in foreign bodies. Um, things like J-clips, carabiners, open clasped chains. If we want to, if we're using any kind of chain material at all, it needs to be welded shut. Um, but these things can easily kind of penetrate, slide onto those beaks when birds are manipulating them and can cause trauma and injuries. Much better options are quick links, which are kind of like carabiners, but they have a little screw that closes them or C-clamps for attaching things to the cage. Um, you can, uh, um, other things that I can see, um, blunt force trauma can cause beak injuries. So things like flying into mirrors or, um, or windows and glass doors like this. 
All right, so talking about beak trauma. So beak punctures are, they're typically most commonly caused from bites by other birds, but like I mentioned, you can also see them from sharp objects or things that can penetrate the beak in their, um, in their cage. When we see beak trauma, when beak punctures, we typically wanna clean and debride any um, loose or broken keratin and reshape that beak a little bit. Um, we also sometimes wanna fix that defect depending on the size of it and how severe it is with a little bit of a, um, acrylic or epoxy resin and you can kind of patch that defect. Beak tip fractures, like on this little kiddo, this little cockatiel right here, um, these most commonly actually happen from falls or impact injuries. So when they um, fly directly into things like windows, this can involve any layer of the beak. It can involve the keratin, the dermis, the bone. It can, so um, sometimes it's not, sometimes more, some of these are more severe than others. Oftentimes these bleed pretty badly. And so the first thing we wanna do is control the hemorrhage. And what we use is often um, silver nitrate, but you can pour cautery here in our clinic. Um, we clean that tissue and make sure it's decontaminated, especially if the dermis and bone are affected. And then if we need to, we can cover that, um, that defect, um, especially if, again, if it's involving the dermis, the blood supply or the bone with a little bit of acrylic or epoxy resin or tissue glue. And if you are using acrylic or epoxy resin, what often happens is as that beak is growing back and healing, um, it'll kind of just grow out with it. Another common injury that we can see, um, luckily not too terribly common, but we do see it is um, beak fractures. And I'm specifically gonna talk about mandibular symphysial fractures, but just keep in mind that the um, the upper beak can also fracture. So um, the two mandibles, so basically the bird mandible, just like the human mandible joins at the center at the mandibular um, symphysis, but with trauma that can easily separate. So this, unfortunately, this type of injury has a very prognosis for successful repair for a few reasons. One, that dermis is quite thin in that area. So there's a little bit of a lack of blood supply. There's also just chronically really strong forces exerted on the beak. And so there's just chronic displacement. And if we are going to try to fix it, it has to be done very soon after, after the injury. What we typically do is try to realign that beak, um, and then we often use cerclage wire, which is a type of um, stainless steel surgical wire, um, or pins, and cover that with acrylic to kind of um, reinforce it. All right, so I knew this was coming. We have some graphic images coming up. Um, so just if you're, again, inclined, not inclined to look at them, um, just for, be forewarned. Uh, if you're wondering what's on my face, <laughs> that's actually a, um, a cockatoo mask that one of my um, one of my friends at work gave me, um, and I was matching my patient that day. So of course we had to get a picture. So beak avulsions are pretty common. We actually this little <clears throat> excuse me lovebird right here we saw just I believe a couple weeks ago for this beak avulsion. Um, these are, I call, we all call these big bird, little bird injuries at work because this is almost always due to a bite from another bird. Um, it's usually just because, you know, it's usually from intraparrot aggression and fighting. When we have a beak avulsion, that uh, it will not regrow. Think about the nail. Again, that bone has been lost. It is gone. And so it's not going to grow back. What you might get is a little bit of a keratinaceous covering where that bone used to be. So you still might see some of that keratin, um, but you're not gonna get a normal beak. That's unfortunately not gonna happen after this. As far as treatment and supportive care goes, what we do is obviously we wanna control the bleeding. This can definitely cause a lot of hemorrhage. We wanna make sure our patient is stable. So providing heat support um, as necessary. As you can imagine, this is pretty painful, so we want to provide pain um, control as well. These kiddos oftentimes do need some nutritional support at first. You would be surprised how quickly they can recover from this. It's often, it's really shocking, <laughs> um, but sometimes we do have to provide nutritional support, and that includes things like tube feeding or even sometimes esophagostomy tubes are listed in the literature. I'll be honest, we don't use them very much at my clinic, um, but, um, but we do oftentimes have to tube feed them to make sure they're getting the nutrition that they need while they're figuring out their new um, their new face. We also um, want to focus on wound care. So the bottom picture here is the, as a, um, actually my technician's bird, um, she had a, a little Quaker with a big, um, a big bird, little bird injury. I feel like it always happens to the Quakers. They're just feisty and they bite off more than they, than they can chew. Um, but you can see how abnormal that bottom beak grows. 
something that we'll talk about, I think on the next slide is where it's listed is how that often requires kind of chronic management and reshaping. So, all right, gross pictures of beaks are done. <laughs> um, prognosis, the prognosis from this is like shockingly great. Um, they, birds recover incredibly quickly. Um, I found one retrospective case study that looked back at about 10 birds that had had um, beak avulsions and nine out of 10 of those birds survived. And all of those birds that did survive were self-feeding by 20 days, but most were doing it much, much faster. That little love bird I showed you guys on the last image was eating within two days on his own. Birds are amazing. Um, so what they do lose is the ability to crack seeds and nuts. And so often they require a softer diet. Birds that are already eating mash are great at this because it's already soft and it's easy for them to adapt. Um, birds that are eating a lot of pellets, sometimes soaking those pellets can help. And so if you do encounter this at home and you can't get to the vet right away, um, and it is a Sunday night and no one's able to help you out, um, to make sure your bird is getting food, try um, try soaking pellets or try um, some softer foods and that can sometimes help. Um, pros and I, I get a lot of questions about prosthetics in parrots and I I have to say, I don't recommend them. Um, they're almost purely aesthetic. It's rarely beneficial to their health. These birds, again, learn to refeed incredibly fast. Um, they, um, and the kinetic forces that the beak exerts, you have to keep in mind, these guys are, you know, the original nutcrackers. They, um, those kinetic forces will lead to failure um, of those prosthetics and require frequent replacement. Um, because the beak is a kinetic and complicated structure and nothing that a person that we make as humans are, is going to be able to correct that. Um, but these guys have such a great prognosis and can live, um, you know, wonderful, wonderful long lives. And I wanted to show you this really funny video of this <laughs> Amazon that had um, previously years and years and years ago lost his maxillary beak. Um, and I think you'll see that he's pretty happy and he's doing great. <laughs> so he doesn't need a prosthetic he's he's clearly very very happy we all had fun with him oh gosh hold on there we go all righty i think i may have skipped too far no i didn't all right so the next topic we're gonna sorry about that the next topic we're gonna talk about is broken skin or skin lesions um, some of the most common causes of these skin lesions that I see um, are listed here. So you can see um, breaks in the skin from, again, intra-bird aggression and bird fighting. Um, other pets in the homes, particularly things like cats um, and dogs and our pet predators that we have. Uh, things, sharp objects in the cage, such as nails, wires, things like that, even screws. Um, and then I really, like I mentioned, I don't see a ton of thermal burns, but they can happen. Burns, birds and burns are um, a little bit unique because bird skin doesn't blister the same way that mammal skin does. Um, so we treat it a little bit differently, but we sometimes do see burns in these guys, especially from um, stoves that have been left on, especially if your bird is out while you're cooking. All right, so again, unfortunately, I have some graphic images coming up of some skin wounds. Um, so just, you know, look at this little picture of the cynical who's helping me write my records. All right, so bird skin has some pretty unique anatomy um, compared to mammals. It is much thinner than mammalian skin. Um, the epidermis or that very top layer of the skin is only about 10 cell layers thick. So very, very thin, um, which unfortunately does lend itself to having being traumatized pretty easily. The skin is very loosely attached to underlying muscle to allow for flight, but it is very firmly attached to underlying bone. So certain injuries um, where the skin is damaged, like the skull in this image, um, or over wings um, or legs um, or directly over the keel, sometimes those can lead to increased tension and be more difficult to heal. And so with bird anatomy, we do have some you know, concerns we have to keep in mind when we talk about repairing these. Um, bird skin also has minimal post-operative swelling. And what that means is basically for us surgeons, we have to make sure that our sutures are placed really closely together um, and also are tight, tighter than we would use in a mammal. Um, avian um, white blood cells like heterophils, which are the type of cells that um, are present during inflammation and infection, don't have the right don't have the enzyme that creates pus like most mammal cells do. Um, so they don't, so they don't really create pus. 
Um, so that means we must thoroughly debride and flush um, these beforehand um, and that drains don't really work because it's not, it's not just that they don't really make pus, it's that they don't make a liquid pus. They make more of what we call um, a caseous or thick pus. Um, so that doesn't drain from wounds. And so if we have a contaminated wound, unfortunately a drain isn't going to work. Um, that thin skin, um, because they do have very thin skin, it dehisses really easily, which can make repair difficult. Um, what this means is we want to leave scabs alone. If, if, if I know I, I'm a picker too, if we see a scab, we want to pick at it and remove it. Um, but the most, the best thing we can do if we see scabbed um, skin on a bird is just let it be and let it heal and let that scab take its course. It also means that we want to make sure we're leaving suture in place for the full 10 to 14 days. So um, this is another um, bird with a skin lesion that we saw at our clinic recently, and it kind, of, it kind of correlates with some of the steps of skin trauma. When a bird comes in with skin trauma, the first thing we want to do is stabilize our patient, again, providing supplemental heat, pain medication, fluid therapy, whatever they may need before attempting to repair the defect. Uh, the typically sometimes skin, this all, all of these steps have to be done under general anesthesia, at least steps two through six. Um, sometimes we're may able to do some of this a little bit without any anesthesia or sedation. Um, but oftentimes, just like in this image, the bird does have to be sedated. We typically debride and flush the wound. Sterile saline is usually my favorite um, for a couple of reasons. While it doesn't have the antimicrobial properties or, you know, but, you know infection fighting properties of chlorhexidine or iodine, um, it's often going to be the least toxic to fibroblasts. And fibroblasts are the cells that produce collagen um, and keep that skin as, you know, and kind of help with wound repair. Um, and hydrogen peroxide has definitely been shown to um, impair uh, fibroblast and wound repair. Not to say that these don't have their place with very contaminated wounds. Of course, I use chlorhexidine and iodine. Um, and with penetrating wounds, hydrogen peroxide is the, um, the solution of choice. But just something to keep in mind that, um, that sometimes sterile saline is what is best. Uh, step four, the next thing we do is, you know, talking about closure and trying to suture that wound closed. There's two ways we can approach a wound. One is with primary closure where we bring those skin edges together. This works great for wounds that are fairly fresh or less than eight hours old, have minimal contamination. Um, and wounds um, like this one on this Quaker that's on his back and doesn't have a lot of tension. Um, for wounds that we do that do have a lot of tension or are older or are highly contaminated or have a very large defect and they can't close, we have to rely on second intention, which is the body's ability to create granulation tissue or that bed of um, fibroblastic tissue that'll create collagen and heal on its own. Obviously, this takes more time, and we typically do use um, solutions like a hydrogel wound dressing or SSD. Um, SSD is great because it's antimicrobial and it can also penetrate necrotic tissue. So we have a bird presenting with a very, very old wound um, where, where the skin looks kind of crusty and quite, um, quite de devitalized, or if the tissue itself does too, SSD can penetrate that. But there is some evidence out there that it can impair wound contraction or that wound's ability to kind of shrink down. So another thing to keep in mind. Um, hydrogel is great. Hydrogel is one of my favorite products to use for um, superficial wounds. Um, not so much for major ones, but for minor ones, it is a great product. It has been shown to enhance fibroblast prol proliferation. So those cells that make the collagen again, um, it stimulates epidermal growth, collagen deposition, angiogenesis, or the formation of new blood vessels. And it also stimulates macrophages, which is kind of like the body's cleanup crew cells to kind of get rid of nasty debris that the body doesn't want in it. Um, so hydrogel is great. I use it all the time. It is not always a great option for very, very, um, very, very contaminated wounds or very, very deep wounds, but for superficial abrasions, it is fantastic. Um, something to keep in mind is we never want to use oil-based products in our birds. Um, so that includes neosporin, which is always a favorite that I see uh, most of my bird parents try to use. Um, oil is not great because it can impair a bird's ability to thermoregulate and it damages feather quality. So, so no oil, no oil-based products, no, um, no neosporin. Um, sometimes we do need to place the collar 
again, birds are going to pick where it hurts and wounds don't feel good. Um, so if this is in an area where a bird can reach and hurt, we oftentimes do have to, um, do have to place a collar in order to, um, prevent themselves from picking, from uh, injuring that. And, um, and sometimes these injuries and these skin wounds are caused by birds themselves, particularly birds that self-mutilate. So that's also an important part of wound management. And then of course, we always wanna make sure we're providing excellent pain management and um, antimicrobial therapy as well. But there are things that you can do at home as well as if you can't get to a veterinarian immediately. Um, let's make sure we're keeping our pets in a clean environment. So making sure that whatever um, our hospital type setup if, or our cage is kept as clean and dust free as possible. Things we don't want to use immediately at home. I would not immediately reach for things like um, rubbing alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. Um, and definitely I would not use Neosporin. Um, and then keeping in mind that if you do see an older wound on your bird and you see a scab, don't pick at it, just let it be. You can, if you have it at home, use um, some SSD or that hydrogel ointment. Um, but I will say that, you know, if you are, especially that's great if you can't get to a vet right away, if you're, you know, like it's going to be, you know, over eight hours, right? Um, go ahead and use that. What I will say though, is that if you're coming in, we're probably going to be flushing the wound. And so we're just going to be removing all that good stuff you're putting on anyway. Um, but I do recommend always calling your vet if you do see skin trauma, because this can lead to, um, this can lead to worse and in, worse infections. And sometimes these do need to be repaired, but those are some things you can do at home to manage it in the meantime. All right, so moving on to broken toes and um, specifically what I wanted to talk about was constricted toe and foot syndrome, um, which I see fairly commonly as well. So what this is, is the circumferential constriction of the toe or the foot by foreign material. This is almost always going to be like, I see hair all the time, um, fibers and strings from clothing, bedding, toys, things like that. Occasionally it's from a leg band. Um, this can happen if the band that is placed on the leg is too small, um, or if a bird gets what's called a split band. And what that is, is um, the bands that are aluminum that normally have a little slit opening. If a bird chews on that or bites down on it, it can cause it to cross over. And I have a picture of this, um, but it can cause constriction if the bird begins to chew at it. If there's an accumulation of debris under the band, like um, dry, dry, dry dead skin, if the bird has something like a xanthoma, which is kind of like a collection of cholesterol crystals, we sometimes see those on budgies. I think I have a picture of one um, that can cause kind of constriction as well. Sometimes even with things like mites, um, we don't see a lot of nematocoptes or mites on these guys anymore, but that can cause a lot of debris to build up under those bands as well. Um, so scabbing and necrotic tissue from other trauma too can can cause the um the some that constricted toe and foot syndrome. So if a bird had um, an injury for some other reason, when that scab forms and begins to shrink down, because there's not really any um there's not a lot of soft tissue between the foot and the underlying bone and you know um, vascular structures, that can actually cause um can cause swelling and necrosis of the tissue as well. We sometimes, I've never seen this, but it's reported in the literature, you can see it secondary to poor circulation. So thinking like of those birds with atherosclerosis or heart disease. We, we see it fairly often in chicks when there is poor humidity or there are incubation issues. So baby birds. Um, but what this causes, as I may have mentioned, is an avascular or lack of blood supply, necrosis or death of tissue to the toe or to the distal foot wherever the, after the wherever the constriction is. So this is an image. Um, you can see that what I mean by the split band on this image, um, where you've got the band that kind of overlaps. This kiddo was pretty unlucky. He had two types of constriction injuries. This actually isn't my picture. I found it um, from another veterinarian's website on discussing the same topic and I um, cited him below. But um, I just thought, I was like, man, what an unlucky bird to have both, you know, two different types of constriction injuries at the same time. Um, but what happens when this occurs is in the early stages, you get swelling um, and edema below the area of the constriction. And oftentimes this is this hurts. The bird is often holding that foot up, chewing at the foot, might have a sh what we call a shifting leg lameness where they kind of are bearing weight on one foot and switch and then bearing weight on one foot and switch. 
Um, but as it progresses, we can see cyanosis or changing of color, particularly a bluish color um, of that foot since blood, um, blood flow has been lost. It can have a desiccated and dry appearance. That's indicated, indicative of tissue death and necrosis. Um, the foot can, in really, um, in really severe cases, if left untreated, the affected toe or foot can even fall off and leave a little nub of necrotic bone exposed. Um, sometimes birds are so, um, obviously this is painful and birds um, are, you know, so inclined to, you know, get rid of this issue that they may even self-amputate, meaning kind of remove it or chew it off themselves. So, okay, we have more um, kind of gross pictures coming up of toes. So you can just look at this adorable baby Kate parrot if you don't want to see those. And I'll let you know when to tune back in. <laughs> All right. So these are pictures um, we've seen at our clinic. Um, these are cases we've seen at our own clinic of um, constrictive toe and foot syndrome. Um, and I think it is kind of like, you know, the best to compare early stage versus late stage of this process. So in the early stage on the left, on this little conure, you can see swelling of that foot where that um, constriction is. And then on the right, you can say that this is, you can see that this didn't, this didn't just happen overnight. Unfortunately, this is, um, you know, this is very late stage necrosis, oftentimes because um, we are worried about, um, oftentimes because it leaves this uh, stub of bone exposed, we worry about infection in these cases as well. All right. I think the gross pictures of feet are done. I don't think this is super gross, but this is kind of like that xanthoma lesion I was talking about, how debris built up heavily under this bird's band due to the swelling um, from his xanth xanthomatous lesion um, and has now led to a constriction injury. The key to addressing these injuries is recognizing it early and dealing with it early. So prompt treatment. After about 24 hours, even if we're not at that very, very late stage necrosis, like that last picture, the prognosis for salvaging a constricted toe or foot is considered poor. Um, and pieces of our body don't like to not have blood flow. Um, and once necrosis is apparent, once you get that desiccated appearance, um, amputation is really our only option. We can't restore blood flow to tissue that has died. Fibers and bands, the first, the, the most important thing is that fibers and bands must need to be removed. I have this in all caps, but really sometimes this can be removed at home, but I really recommend coming into a veterinarian to have the fibers and bands or whatever is constricting these things removed um, for a couple of reasons. Oftentimes, again, as I keep saying, all of these things require pain management. So we need to make sure our birds are comfortable and we're uh, giving them some pain control. A lot of the times these fibers are very, very small. And I oftentimes have to use magnifying loops in order to remove um, the fibrous bands of the um, of string or hair or whatever it may be. We also need appropriate tools. This is gonna be things like microsurgical instruments. Um, sometimes if it's a band um, that isn't aluminum, we need band cutters. Um, so those are things obviously I have at my disposal as a veterinarian. So I do recommend bringing um, a kiddo with this condition into the vet. Depending on the severity, we may or may not need to place a bandage if it's very early in constriction syndrome. Sometimes we don't need to, um, but sometimes if it's later, we do. And then occasionally if we're getting towards that point where we do have more necrotic tissue, we have to consider surgical debridement or amputation, unfortunately. But there are some things you can do at home to try to mitigate this before you call us or get in or are able to get into us. Um, really, the best thing here is prevention. So avoiding bedding and toys that contain stray fibers. Um, so looking at you, happy huts. Um, so avoiding bedding and toys that contain those stray fibers. Being mindful of long hairs. Um, I say as I have my hair down on my shoulders, but particularly if your bird um, spends a lot of time sitting on your shoulders, being very mindful of long hair. Um, maybe considering tying it up before you interact with your bird if they want to be on your shoulder. Um, and then one thing you can do for prevention too, consider having the leg band removed by your veterinarian. Um, lots of times leg bands don't provide a lot of benefit or information, um, so it's not a bad idea to consider having it removed. We also, so if, if we're working with babies, which um, I know most of us aren't, but we want to consider he proper humidity for um, young birds to avoid kind of this constrictive toe syndrome, which this is a picture of it from Journal of Avian Veterinary Medicine or Journal of Avian Medicine and Surgery. Um, so you kind of get these constrictive fibers. 
papers that form when the humidity is inappropriate. Um, in early cases, what you can do is you can apply some SSD because it's very hydrating and you can also try to massage the affected toe or foot very, very, very gently. Um, and, but when this, um, when this is present, we can expect healing to take weeks to months for, for things to heal, depending on the severity of the affected toes and feet. All right, <laughs> we're at bones, which is what everybody thinks about when we, um, when we talk about things that break, but I put it at the end because it is a daunting topic. And I was wondering how I was going to fit all of avian orthopedics into this lecture, but we I pared it down. We're going to make it as succinct as possible. So Burns bones are incredibly unique and very, very cool. They have a lot of adaptations for flight. Um, and this includes very, very thin and brittle cortices. I don't have, a, I should have put a picture of my presentation of bone anatomy, but um, as you may or may not know, all of our bones are, um, are a bit, are not necessarily hollow, but have two different structures. You have the cortical bone, which is the outside part of the tube that's very, very strong and sturdy and gives our bone structure. And then you have the inner part that's more woven bone um, or the um, or in the bone marrow as well. Um, and then birds, in order for them to be able to fly, they had to sacrifice having very, very strong bones with thick cortices because bone is heavy. And so they have very thin cortices um, that unfortunately break very easily. They also have very wide medullary cavities that may be pneumatic or may contain um, air, so more specifically may contain diverticulums or outpouchings of an air sac. Um, most of their um, blood supply because of this, especially in a pneumatic bone um, and, and not listed here, but I think I mentioned it later, in female birds that are egg laying or have um, increased estrogen, if they're very hormonal, you get deposition of medullary bone because they are just organizing all of this calcium and kind of just mobilizing all of it in their bodies, they actually start to deposit calcium um, in their bones. And so you lose some of that medullary cavity. So the blood supply to the bone is primarily from the periosteum, which is a little unique to birds. So we'll go through some anatomy so we can understand the different bones and what we're talking about when we're talking about some of these bones breaking. With the wings um, kind of going from innermost to outermost, we have the pectoral girdle or the shoulder joint. This is the articulation of four different bones in birds the humerus, um, the scapula, the coracoid, which is a bone that's kind of unique to birds, um, reptiles, and some monotremes, um, and the clavicle. The humerus is um, pneumatic in most species, um, so if, if parrots at least, um, and so it contains air. Uh, it contains the lateral diverticulum of the clavicular air sac, to be specific. Uh, the humerus is also pretty cool because for flight, um, it has a massive range of motion. It, um, it can elevate, it can depress, it can protract, it can retract, it can do dorsal and ventral rotation. Um, and it's also a little bit stout compared to um, other animals. The ulna is actually the largest um, bone within the wing. Um, it's larger than the humerus um, and you have the paired radius and ulna. Um, you have your radial and ulnar carpal, carpal bones or the wrist, basically the wrist joint. Uh, you have the carpometacarpus, which is the fused major and minor metacarpal bones, which is that kind of funky looking bone with that central, you know, cavity right there. And then typically um, birds have three digits, the allular digit, um, which is digit one, and then the minor and major digits, digits um, uh, two and three, which are the proximal and distal phalanx. Talking about legs, we have the pelvic girdle, which is the um, ilium, ischium, and pubis. Um, and then the femur is the bone that kind of creates that um, hip joint. The, um, pelvic, the pelvic girdle is pretty interesting in birds. Um, the bones of the pelvis are all partially fused with each other and there's no pubic symphysis that allows for the passage of eggs in adult female birds. The femur is unusually short and stout in most of our birds. Um, they have a patella. And then they have the tibiotarsus, um, which is the largest bone in the bird's leg. It is the fusion of the tibia and the proximal row of tarsal bones. Um, they do have a fibula. It extends about two thirds the length of the tibiotarsus and then fuses with it. They have their um, ankle joint, basically the equivalent of their ankle um, or their hock is the intertarsal joint. 
they have their tarso metatarsus, which is the fusion of the distal tarsal bones to the metatarsal bones. And then they have um, four digits. This picture is clearly not a parrot um, because the digit four should be rotated backwards um, if it was, but um, they have uh, four digits on their feet. And in parrots, those digits are zygodactyl, meaning two in the front and two in the back. So there's definitely, because of their unique bone anatomy, um, considerations that we have to think about when we have a when we have a bird that comes in with a fracture. These fractures are often open, meaning communicating with the environment going through the skin, because they have very, very thin skin and minimal soft tissue coverage. They're often comminuted, which means that it's not just one break, there's multiple breaks in the bone. And this is because they, again, they have very, very thin and brittle cortices. Um, the thin brittle cortices makes repair really difficult because it doesn't usually provide enough purchase for things like bone screws or hardware like bone plates. Um, and it also is really difficult because they have really powerful flight muscles that can cause rotational deformity, especially if a wing has been fractured. Joint immobilization is also often a concern with trying to manage these um, because with things like bandages um, and trying to immobilize the joints in order to allow those fractures to heal, it can lead to ligament and tendon contracture and decreased range of motion. So it's kind of important to talk, talk about how bones heal to understand how we decide to approach a fracture patient. So bone healing is a combination of varying degrees of three different types of healing. There's primary healing, which is bone to bone healing. This happens through um, something called the Haversian Haver canals. I can never say that right. Um, or the cortical bone, um, the living pieces of the cortical bone. When this happens, um, it produces minimal callus formation. It creates um, the strongest, um, the strong, it's kind of the strongest way bones can heal, um, but it's really difficult and rarely achieved in birds because of those thin cortices and because of those, the pull of those powerful flight muscles. It is only achieved by rigid fixation and perfect bone apposition. So usually with sur um, surgery. This is, and then um, this, obviously this is the goal, but like I mentioned, unfortunately, very rarely achieved. Endosteal callus formation is that kind of internal callus formation of fibrous tissues and cartilage tissues and things like that, that happens from within the inside of the bone. Um, this occurs really quickly when bones are aligned, but we still have to consider again, our, um, our, our egg laying and reproductively active females that may not have much of this, as well as the bones that typically are pneumatic or contain air sacs. Um, obviously, they're not going to be able to do much of this. And so periosteal callus formation, peri the periosteum being the outer lining of the bone that has the most robust blood supply, is what does most of the callus formation. Um, and this is especially um, important when fractures are not aligned. It's the primary way that um, fractures that aren't aligned well heal. Um, but yeah, so um, those are the three different types of bone healing that we see. The most common question I get asked is how fast does bone heal? The rate of healing is going to depend on so many things, um, how severely displaced those bone fragments are, the blood supply to the bone. This is important if the periosteum has been damaged, that if that blood supply has been damaged, um, if it's not intact um, through either being through the fracture or if it's damaged through surgery itself, healing can take up to 18 weeks. Um, and again, considering the present the presence of potentially medullary bone in the female birds and the air and those pneumatic bones, infection decreases rate of healing as does movement. Um, stable and well aligned fractures in birds heal much faster than they do in mammals. We often see clinical stability at two to three weeks, um, and we can see radiographic evidence of bony remodeling, which is where you get that bone deposition um, around that ca um, that callus in about four to eight weeks. So that's the that's the silver lining of avian bone healing. Um, there's a couple of different ways we can um, heal a bone fracture, um, and that's external coaptation, which is splints and bandages, or surgical fixation. Um, external coaptation or splints and bandages do take a little bit longer. By the first week, you can sometimes feel a callus on that leg when they come in for recheck, but oftentimes it's not really well healed. It still has movement and it still needs that bandage in place. By about two weeks, that movement is very much reduced. By three, we typically don't have movement if things have gone well and you have an endosteal callus formation. 
And by five to eight weeks, um, we do start to see healing and bony remodeling. With surgery, um, especially if surgery is, is successful, bone can heal much faster. Usually by two weeks, we start seeing union of that um, fracture. And by three, we start seeing bony remodeling. So there are a lot of options for fracture management that we have to keep in mind. Um, so whenever we're deciding to, um, whenever we're kind of deciding how we want to approach a fracture, um, these are the four different options that we think of. And sometimes it's a combination of these. Sometimes we have to start with, um, with uh, something like coaptation and then we move to surgery. Um, sometimes it's a combination of things like cage rest and coaptation. So it's not always just one thing. But we, we can heal a bone by bandaging or splinting it. And there are some times where this is the best option. Um, sometimes surgical fixation is the best option. And then oftentimes, um, cage rest is always a part of bone healing, but sometimes just doing cage rest um, is what's best. This is really only true for a small number of situations. Um, so very, very tiny birds like canaries and finches um, where things like surgery and even bandaging are very, very difficult. Um, or for um, particular fractures that can't be um, that can't be uh, splinted or surgically fixed, so things like pelvic fractures. What we decide to do in terms of um, fracture management does depend on the severity of the fracture, the location of the fracture, the forces acting on the fracture. Um, the degree of function necessary and comorbidities. So I think of fracture management in these guys as both an art and a science because it's very complicated. And it, I never take the I never make the decision to um, I never make the decision to pursue fracture management lightly. There's so much to take into account. Um, because things like, you know, for example, here's this, these x-rays are a recent case that we had. This is a, um, I don't know if you can see it very well. Unfortunately, these x-rays aren't the best, but this is a comminuted femur fracture in a, um, senior, I think he was middle, like, you know, upper twenties son conure who had a history of atherosclerosis and a heart murmur. So really not an ideal surgical candidate. Um, you know, we definitely, this is not a bird we want to have under anesthesia for any prolonged amount of time um, in order to try to surgically, you know, place pens and correct that bone. Um, but it's also not a bone that is going to be able to be splinted. As we'll talk about when we're talking about healing bones, you have to stabilize a joint above and below the fracture. And you really can't stabilize the hip joint in a bird. Um, so you can you would continue to have movement and torque on that um, fracture. Um, also with his comorbidities, you know, clearly we didn't want to go to surgery, but we needed to do something for him. He can't just live with this. So after discussing with um, the owner about, you know, our goals and want, you know, what we want to accomplish, we actually decided that amputation was the best option because amputation is a much faster surgery. We're talking about a relatively small sized bird. Um, and, um, you can provide, you know, we can, if we get rid of that painful fracture, we can provide potentially more years of, you know, of pain-free high quality life. So sometimes amputation, unfortunately, is the best option. I never jump to it. I always try to think of my other options, but sometimes that is what we need to consider. Um, something we also have to think about when talking about amputation and um, really a lot of management of fractures in general too, is the degree of function necessary for some of these, for, for some of these birds. Um, you know, in wildlife, obviously it's a bit different, you know, you want to kind of restore a bird to full functionality and flight so that they can survive. Um, and not that I encourage your parrots to be perched potatoes, but they're definitely not the Olympic athletes of birds and when they're living in our homes. So many birds are happy to kind of climb around and perch and not necessarily fly great distances or take, you know, these long, these, you know, massive, um, you know, episodes of flight. Um, and they can often do quite well, even with some decreased um, amount of function in their affected limb. So these are all things that we keep in mind when we're making our decisions. I don't know why that's doing that. All right. So going through our options for fracture repair, like I mentioned, um, I'm going to talk mostly about external coaptation um, and bandaging and surgical repair. The, of course, there's advantages to um, both and disadvantages to each. 
The advantages to um, bandaging are that one, there's a decreased risk of infection because we're not introducing anything with surgery. There's less damage to that regional vasculature because again, we're not going in surgically and accidentally or I, what we call iatrogenically injuring any structures. Um, there is minimal or, you know, there's minimal to no anesthetic um, risk or surgical risk, clearly, if you're not approaching it um, surgically. So for some of our um, high risk surgery and anesthetic patients, that's what we want to consider. This is really a great option for our very tiny patients, you know, like budgies or um, our very small parrots where, um, where surgery may not be the most feasible option. It's also inexpensive and very fast for us to do. However, obviously we get restricted joint motion and soft tissue contract contraction. Um, not always, you don't, ha you don't necessarily get that, but you're definitely at risk for it with, um, with bandaging. You definitely want to make sure we're replacing that bandage often and doing physical therapy often. We are also at risk for malalignment or rotation and shortening because again, we can't perfectly line up those fracture fragments. Um, it does take longer to heal um, a fracture with bandaging and splinting alone than it does with surgical surgical, repla surgical repair. Um, and you do encounter the risk of delayed healing and non-union. You also risk pressure necrosis if you inappropriately place the bandage. So, and then as far as surgical repair goes, the advantages are obvious. It's going to um, oftentimes heal faster. You have better return to function. You have better apposition. The disadvantages um, from a medical standpoint, risk of trauma is pretty great because of the very thin, fragile, brittle cortices. Um, and then you also have to deal with the risk of introducing infection, um, particularly with pneumatic bones, we worry about contaminating the respiratory tract. Something else to keep in mind too, um, aside from surgical and anesthetic risk too, is the cost. These, uh, these procedures are unfortunately not inexpensive and for some people that does need to play, um, that does need to be something that's considered. So these are some examples of um, external coaptation or bandaging and splinting, and we'll kind of go through each of them. Um, so the first one is a body wrap. This provides very simple stabilization of the wing. And often when a bird is presenting with a wing fracture, even before we get them to surgery, this is what we want to do in order to um, prevent any further displacement and injury. What it is, is um, basically this in this little budgie, we used a little bit of tape, but um, you kind of basically wrap that tape around the body in one pass, and then again around the wing um, at kind of the level of the mid keel. It takes a little bit of practice to get it just right because you want it to be loose enough so that there is um, the ability that the bird can easily breathe. Obviously they are expanding their keel when they breathe, so you need them to have that movement, but you also want it to be um, tight enough to provide stability. Um, this is really a great option for shoulder girdle, shoulder girdle fractures, particularly coracoid fractures. This is actually the treatment of choice because surgery is a bit more complicated and not recommended typically. Um, but it also provides, like I mentioned, great temporary stabilization. Figure of eight bandages. Um, this is actually the same budgie. <laughs> um, I actually don't remember exactly what his fracture was. I believe it was maybe his humerus, but um, he. Uh, we, you can use them together. You can use a body wrap and a figure of eight together. What the figure of eight does um, is it encompasses the wing from the, um, basically the shoulder to the carpus and it immobilizes the distal wing. So the elbow and beyond. What we do is we use, um, in small birds, we skip the gauze, but in usually in larger birds, if we're placing a figure of eight, you use gauze and bandage wrap. Um, and, but obviously in the small kiddo, all we used was the vet wrap bandage wrap and you kind of go around the carpus um, when the bird is in a natural resting position um, and kind of go around the wing in, um, in a way that makes it look like the shape of an eight. So there are complications associated with this. Um, with radial and ulnar fractures, even though it can be used for those, you can get things like synostosis, which is where you have basically um, bony callus formation between the radius and ulna in the antebrachium, and you lose that rotational um, ability, which can impact the ability to fly. 
uh, but um, it can also lead to contracture if you leave this on for greater than seven days. So ideally we're replacing this bandage weekly and then actually in an ideal situation, we're replacing it every two to three days. You're doing it quite frequently. And then at the time you're replacing it, we're also doing physical therapy of that joint to make sure that we don't lose range of motion. This isn't always optimal or ideal because sometimes these bandages have to re be replaced placed under anesthesia. And we obviously are not, you know, we don't want to put our birds under general anesthesia or even sedate them every two to three days sometimes. So it really, again, kind of depends on the individual. But this is a great option for things like elbow luxations, metacarpal fractures, um, and in some, in some instances, particularly with small birds, radial and ulnar fractures. Uh, this is a, the next one is a picture of an Altman tape splint. Um, we do quite a few of these. Um, it definitely takes a little bit of practice to get good at, but what we do is um, this is basically what this is used for is for tibiotarsal fractures in birds that are, um, I would say small to medium, um, anything less than 300 grams. This is a good option for, um, you kind of get the bone in as much alignment as possible and then put the limb in a normal um, perching position and you create thick layers of tape. You can use here um, bandaging tape, but we often use um, painter's tape or masking tape at our clinic as well. And you make it pretty thick. So layering it on top of each other again and again and again and overlapping it to make it stable and sturdy. Um, and then place um, the pieces kind of basically sandwich the leg between those two pieces. And then like in this picture, using a hemostat, which is a surgical tool to tighten that tape and, um, and then kind of cutting it down to size. So that's before we kind of cut it down to make it a little bit less irritating for the other side of the bird. This last picture, we don't do a ton of these. And unfortunately I didn't have a parrot um, picture with this, although we, I have done it in a parrot before, um, but this is a young turkey poult um, with a tibiotarsal fracture. This is an Altman tape splint. It is also used to, or not Altman tape, sorry. This is, that was an Altman tape splint. This is a modified Robert Jones. It is also used for tibiotarsal fractures. Um, it is heavily padded and really, really thick. Um, and so this is more of our larger, medium to larger birds when they have these injuries, but we really don't want to use them more long-term. It really should only be short-term because as you may be able to tell in this image, that leg has to be completely extended for this to work. And that is not a natural position for birds. Um, it's a lot of cotton padding overwrapped with gauze and then bandage material. Um, and it can cause complications if it is placed too tightly or if there is uneven tightness, you can get swelling of the toes. So these are probably the four most common bandages that we place and the ones that I'm most familiar with. All right, so as far as surgical fracture examples of different ways we surgically fix fractures, um, the first one I wanna talk about is intramedullary pins. So on the next slide, it was kind of hard to organize this. On the next slide, and the we typically use um, an IM pin with something else like an external fixator, which we'll talk about, to create kind of a hybrid situation. But an IM pin is um, is really really helpful because it provides really uh, really good um, resistance to bending forces. Uh, it's basically a stainless steel pin or rod that's inserted into the medullary cavity of the bone. Um, while it's really good at, bend, at resisting bending forces, it's not really good at resisting other forces. It lacks rotational stability. So that's why we often combine it with an external skeletal fixator and create something called a tie-in. Uh, this does have to be secured in some manner or the patient may remove it. So that there's a little Quaker um, x-ray at the top. He was a re recent patient of ours that did um, actually end up somehow managing to remove um, his eye and pin, not completely, but he did dislodge it a little bit. Um, so important to kind of keep in mind that this does need to be pretty secure. Um, we also have um, what's called an external skeletal fixator, also called an ESF, also called an X-fix. Um, and this is great for bones that don't have an appropriate medullary cavity for an IM pin or an intramedullary pin. It's basically um, two transfixion pins that go into the bone and then are connected externally by a connecting bar across. Um, you can kind of help st um, stabilize these with dental acrylic and clamps. This is great at resisting rotational and tensile forces, but less good at bending forces. Um, and it's really the treatment of choice when you can't use a hybrid fixator or you can't place an IM pin. Um, 
this is an x-ray where it was used to um to fit to correct a fracture of the metacarpal bones which is probably the most common the most common external fixator i can think of in birds where this is used um, without an im pin so then we have the hybrid fixer or the tie-in this is so this is basically just a combination it's basically just im pin plus external fixator um it's the most versatile and effective system for long bone fractures in birds. It has the best strength and integrity um, and is able to resist all of those bending forces on the bone, all the bending, the rotational, the um, all basically it kind of, because you're combining them, resists the different forces that can be exerted on the fracture. Um, it does result in primary bone healing if it's well aligned, which is ideal. Um, it does have to be removed um, sequentially, so one piece at a time after you get radiographic evidence of healing. Um, this is a picture of one that was done in, at our clinic in a chicken. So don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> I know that we got really deep into orthopedics those past couple of slides and that this chart is a nightmare. So don't, don't focus on it too much. The big takeaway from this chart that I want you guys to have, um, I kind of made this chart um, after reading several different textbooks, several different articles, um, several getting opinions from several different people. Um, and what I really want the big takeaway to be is that fractures are not one size fits all. Um, they are, there are multiple options for fractures. And this is this is chart in general is very, very, very generalized. It does not take into account size of the patient, necessary, necess, uh, God, um, <laughs> necess, basically how functional their limb needs to be or their comorbidities. So when we approach fractures, we have to keep all of that in mind. There is no one um, kind of cut and dry approach to a fracture. So that is what I want your main takeaway to be. But if you're interested in talking fractures and getting nerdy about it, I can go into more depth with some of these individual ones. Um, but that's what I want the main takeaway to be is, you know, fractures are complicated and we don't always, um, we, we sometimes, you know, sometimes we have to get a little creative. <laughs> Important things to keep in mind with fractures um, is a, a convalescent care or managing their pain, um, as well as things like physical therapy and um, their their home as well. We With fractures, it's really important to me to make sure I'm approaching pain from multiple perspectives and at multiple different points. So um, preoperatively, I usually use, um, I like to try to use some opioids for pain management. Um, perioperatively or preoperatively, um, while we're under anesthesia, you can also use um, local blocks or splash blocks with lidocaine um, or bupipacaine. Um, I typically use lidocaine. Uh, for moderate and severe pain, we do want to continue to use, um, and post-operative pain, honestly, you do want to continue to use opioids afterwards to address that more severe pain. We typically use a lot of butorphanol, and oftentimes I send home tramadol, which is a synthetic opioid that can be used at home orally. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are an important part of this as well for um, post-op pain and for inflammation. Typically in our parrots, we're using meloxicam. Um, and we do want to administer pain medication for about one to two weeks postoperatively or after a fracture as well, even if we're just using bandaging. As far as patient management, this is where the hospital type setup comes into play. These kiddos need to act like they are on bed rest. We do not want them climbing. We want low perches only. Um, especially because like I mentioned at the beginning, sometimes birds can get a bit anxious when they don't have anything to perch on, which makes them more prone to kind of flop around and injure their, um, their splinted or surgical site. Um, so rolling, doing a rolled perch with a towel can be really helpful. Um, keeping them in a dark, warm and quiet environment. So limited visibility, um, covering things with, covering half of the cage or the um, hospital type setup really with a towel can kind of help keep them calm and less likely to um, injure themselves. We also wanna take a look at their diet. Um, and, you know, obviously when a patient comes with a fracture, you know, I, I want to make sure they're on a good diet, but this isn't the first thing I jump at. Um, but we do, after the fracture, want to make sure that we are, um, we're getting, you know, 
we're making sure we're getting appropriate amounts of things like calcium, vitamin D3, um, and then vitamin C is really important for connective tissue as well. So making sure we're getting all the appropriate vitamins and minerals through our diet, which a all seed diet typically lacks most of those, if not all of them. Um, when we have a fracture patient, we're not immediately trying to compel it, convert them or get them on a new diet. That animal is painful. It is stressed. I'm not going to focus on um, diet conversion right away. So sometimes we do need to give them supplemental calcium. Um, physical therapy is also important. Our goals are to provoke, um, promote good range of motion and reduce recovery time. Um, and then also we um, want to make sure we're, you know, kind of doing that passive range of motion and um, thermotherapy can be really helpful too after surgery. Um, cold compresses can decrease swelling while warm prep compresses can increase blood flow. So directly after surgery, sometimes cold compresses, as long as the patient is um, warm and stable can be helpful. Um, to decrease some of that swelling. Um, and before physical therapy sessions, sometimes you can place a warm compress to kind of get some blood flow to that area and then cool compress afterwards to decrease um, any inflammation. So that, that was all I have for you guys today. Um, thank you. If you've made it this far with me, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it. Um, and I'll turn it over to Anne now. Gosh, uh, thanks so much, Dr. Carruthers, for uh, agreeing to let us record this because it was packed full of so it many It was a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I have even more questions, and there are some other questions. Um, but before I forget, if you're an IAABC member, that's the, those of us who are behavior consultants, uh, your code word today is trauma. Just email us, and we'll send you the information for getting your CEUs for that. So um, yay, great except for um, tragedies, of course. We don't like to see anybody in pain, right? I was so. talking to a I was talking to a client about this yesterday. I get so excited about pathology, but also so sad because you know we want the best for our patients, but I find this stuff deeply interesting. So yeah. I'm glad you do because somebody has to help them when it happens and you know it happens to all of us. So uh, I was wondering, um, it, how often you see birds with ruptured air sacs and what, what causes that and what to do about it? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I did not think to include that in my lecture today, but that would have been a really great topic. Um, I see birds with ruptured air sacs very frequently and it can happen for a variety of reasons. I can see it from trauma. Um, that's probably the most common reason or anything that exerts abnormal pressures on the air sacs. So um, respiratory disease is another reason I can sometimes see it. So sometimes Re with really bad things like aspergillus infections or really bad bacterial um, or other fungal air sacculitis that causes pressures. Unfortunately, with air sac ruptures, treatment is limited to making sure that the, and there's, there's more options coming out, um, but um, for, for the most part, um, doing things like draining the air with a needle doesn't do anything because every time a bird takes a breath, it's going to build back up. Um, and if no one is sure what an air sac rupture is, it's essentially, it usually is happening from the clavicular um, or the um, cervical air sacs that communicate with, that are just underneath the skin. And it's a very, very thin few cell layer tissue that with trauma can, or um, different pressures can rupture. Air leaks under the skin. You get like a bubble like appearance, typically around the neck or the head of the bird or on their backs. Um, but um, you, when you drain the air, it just fills back up. So that's not a great way to manage it. Um, surgically managing it while possible is incredibly difficult because those air sacs are very, very thin and suture doesn't hold very well. But um, I believe it was actually Dr. Laura Thielen at ExoticsCon this past year that gave a lecture um, about some different techniques she was using. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have better surgical options for these in the future. But a lot of times it's managing the pain immediately um, with things like um, meloxicam or if a really severe trauma has a cure occurred, opioid medications. Um, but those birds, I've met birds that have had air sac ruptures and kind of bubbly skin <laughs> for years and years and years, and they typically adapt and do just fine once they've healed from their trauma. I have one. Um, mm -hmm. we also had one recently that was adopted by a vet and she actually did surgery where she put a button with lots of holes on the air sac so that oh. the air could release through the holes of the button. Yeah. Yeah. Very clever. Yeah. Stints can sometimes be placed too. Um, I've, I, I think um, I've heard of some people even using like 
tissue glue, but I mean, there's, I, I think that, you know, some of those, it, it, they can be difficult to, difficult to treat. And I think when you have a difficult to treat problem, sometimes you get some pretty innovative and sometimes kind of nutty solutions, but I like the button idea. That's cute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The one I live with will all of a sudden blow up really big and um, that makes it hard then for the food and the water to go down. So she ends up, you know, just gagging it back out again, but you yeah. know, for the most part, it doesn't come back very often, but I wondered yeah. what, what caused things like that? Yeah, usually um, from from what I've seen, trauma, respiratory, trauma and respiratory infections are the most common, but anything that can exert abnormal pressures on the air sac. Like maybe even somebody who wasn't uh, familiar with bird anatomy could squeeze them too hard? Um. I suppose so. I see a lot of it from attacks from other pets. Um, so things like when when um, birds are fighting with each other or um, particularly with puncture wounds, I see that a lot. Um, so I see it a lot, not, not, you know, not necessarily a parrot thing, but in ducks and, um, chickens that live outdoors after fox attacks, when they come in, a lot of them have punct um, puncture wounds that have led to ruptured air sacs, but it's very difficult to squeeze a bird hard enough to cause a ruptured air sac because most of the air sacs that are rupturing and causing the displaced air, um, are going to be along the head and the neck. Um, because internal air sacs, like the um, abdom the abdominal, the paired abdominal air sacs, the caudal and cranial thoracic air sacs, those are all kind of encased by bone for the most part and by the body wall. So those are fairly well protected. It's really that cervical air sac and the um, sometimes the intraclavicular that are most at risk of rupturing. And it's really hard to put too much. It's I, I tell I see a lot of clients when I um, restrain a bird for an exam or a procedure, they get really anxious. They're like, "You're going to choke them," and I'm like, "They have right. complete tracheal rings. It's very hard to do that. <laughs> do not right. worry. Um, just don't so, squeeze the lungs." Yeah, yeah. I suppose if you I suppose if you just don't know your own strength, that could be possible. But usually, it's more puncture type wounds that I see, or collisions like um, flying into windows, um, things like that. The Quaker that you, the blue Quaker that had the puncture wound, I missed what, what caused that puncture wound? Oh, which, oh, the one that I, we sutured the back of the neck. Uh -huh. He was a self mutilator. Yeah. Oh. So he had actually mutilated his skin. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Very common uh, with the Quakers. <laughs> indeed. Uh, you know, I always worry about chain and fabric. Do you see birds that get their toes stuck in chain and fabric a lot? All the time. And in fact, yeah, that that picture I had of that nail avulsion, um, that was a green cheek conure that had had gotten his toes stuck in a towel, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really really common um, to it's really, really common to see nails get stuck and things like that. Um, and in chains, maybe not so much chains. I don't see a lot of people that have chains as um, part of their homes. And, and but occasionally we do, but I think fabric's more common because it provides just enough. It gives you just enough of something for them to get caught on. Mm -hmm. Especially a fabric that doesn't pull apart like mop fabric or fleece. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. A lot of people get worried about those rope perches. I've never seen that be a problem. They seem to fray pretty easily. Have you? I've never seen rope perches be a problem with nails getting caught. I have seen them be a problem for some birds that like to chew at them and eat and ingest them. Right. Um, that, so I've seen more of that with them, but never, um, I suppose it's possible, but I've never seen it be an issue with, um, with nails getting caught. I think I worry more about the bigger birds with small chain links. And yes, that's a good the bird point. has really long nails that aren't kept in better that's shape. That's a good point. And that's why it's so important. Our, we have to think about our birds and our homes and in, um, as our pets aren't coming into contact with the same types of things that would naturally be abrading their nails. And so it is... It's of no, I, I, it's of no fault of the owners that their bird's nails are, you know, are growing or getting long, but it is our responsibility to make sure that they are maintaining them. Sometimes mm -hmm. some birds with appropriate perches and a lot of, you know, sometimes with a lot of things that can abrade those nails, some more like natural wood type things, they can sometimes keep their nails in check, but most of our birds in our homes can't. So that's why it's important to get regular grooming done, um, typically by a veterinarian. So 
um, is, or just someone who's very familiar with bird anatomy. Cause as you guys saw, the nails can, the nails are part, it's a bone. It's, it's very different. <laughs> right. And I worry when people put a concrete perch in the cage and think that they've done their job and yeah, it's not enough. The bottom of the feet are all pink and right. Exactly. It's get not long. Enough. Yeah. 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 It's just, you know, like I'm in, like in the wild, you know, they're going to be, there's just so many different textures that are going to play a factor into, um, into how birds are maintaining their feet and maintaining their um, nails they're constantly gripping things of different diameters of different textures and you just as people we're just never going to be good enough at mimicking nature for them to be able to maintain that on their own right right um I'm sure you see a lot of wounds like from dogs and cats we've experienced a lot of dog bites we've never had a cat problem but what if somebody did have a cat bite isn't that uh, lethal pretty fast so it can be the bacteria that they, there's, there's a bacteria that they worry about. Um, so cats typically it's, they produce different types of injuries. Dogs produce crushing injuries. And so mm -hmm. usually with dog attacks, we see more fractures um, and things like that. With cats, we see a lot of puncture wounds because cats pierce, they don't crush. Um, mm -hmm. So um, there's, and there, I know there's that uh, cat mouths and dog, like all mouths or claws are gross and carry bacteria. Um, and I know there is some talk about, you know, like cats have like certain bacteria that are more harmful. Anytime we're introducing any bacteria to a bird that is not a part of its normal flora, things can get pretty, birds can become very, very ill and even septic from that very quickly. So I would say that with any animal attack, it can be fatal pretty quickly, not just cats. Okay. Of course, this is a good time to say that uh, people bacteria and bird bacteria are very different. So don't feed your bird out of your mouth. Oh yeah. my God. For so many, for so many reasons, please don't do that. <laughs> I see people uh, so proud of that all the time. And I'm like, no, yes. no, <laughs> no. Yep. Yep. Our, our floor, our gut flora is very, very different than theirs. <laughs> right. right. You mentioned hydrogel. Um, and I looked it up on Amazon while you were talking about it. Um, there were quite a few different companies. Were there any particular ones that you most recommended that people so wanted to I, Yeah, I, and it's only because I have the most experience with it. Um, I use Vetrisin. Um, I like That's the consistency of it. Um, there are so many, Hydrogel is a, like a group of types of uh, ointments and uh, dressings and not just necessarily one. I personally use Vetrisin, but there's several on the market. I'm blinking right now, trying to name another one. Is that V E T R I C Y N? Yes, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, there was a Mara Gel and Demora seem to be the two bigger ones on Amazon, so I didn't know they were just. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, the main, the active ingredient is, um, oh gosh, it is hypochloric acid. Is the active ingredient in it? Um, it's a great antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory. Um, so anything where that it's, that's the active ingredient would probably be fine. I just, I have the most experience with that one. Um, it's, and it's incredibly safe. It's like safe if the bird gets it in their mouth or in their eyes, it doesn't cause any trauma. Um, so we use it at our clinic. Um, and that's the one I'm most familiar with. And so that's the one I'm most comfortable recommending. That's not a prescription version. That's a, a look that's available on the market. I think you can get it on Chewy. I'm not, I am, I'm pretty sure you can get it on Chewy. Uh, what did you say the active ingredient is again? I want to make sure and get that. Um, I believe it's hypochloric acid. It's been a while since I've read the, the insert. Okay. I'm like 95% sure that that's what it is. And the geek in me wants to know what this means. Lateral diverticulum of the clavic yeah. clavicle air sac. What does that yeah. mean? So I wish I had a good picture. So the clavicular, so birds have, for the most part, um, you get bilateral symmetry of everything on our bodies, right? Wait, say it, um, say it, say it real basic. Like, okay. Okay. Gotcha. So are, most air sacs are yeah. paired structures. Uh -huh. The clavicular air sac is an air sac that exists kind of at the front of the chest of a bird. And it can like, it has diverticula into the clavicles and sometimes also what is diverticulum. Oh, sorry. An out pouching, an out pouching. Like think so of lateral like diverticulum means something extruded. Yes, yes. So it's like a um so lateral meaning to the side and then diverticulum meaning like I mean outpouching is the best word I can come up with for it, but almost like a cul-de-sac of like the air sac basically, you know, kind of coming off of the main body of it and going into the clavicle and into the um the humerus. 
because you were talking about that when you're talking about the bone anatomy. Yeah, pneumatic bones, exactly. Yeah. So I, I would, couldn't quite picture what that meant. That's okay. good. To know. I'll I'll definitely um I'll definitely consider having a picture of that next <laughs> time. <laughs> um so, some other questions, quite a few questions from others. Um when you were talking at the beginning about uh quick stop, I know I've always been a little concerned about it in certain applications. What does is, are there places you should not use it? Um, I wouldn't place it on um, a mucous membrane. So mouths, um, tongue, like inside the mouth. Um, I know I use it on the beak sometimes and it can be really, really helpful. I try not to put it like on the tongue um, and I try not to put it on um, like skin. That's not really a great option for skin either. Um, especially because I mean it contains, and I, I, it contains benzocaine and I think it would be really, really difficult to overdo it with benzocaine, but like technically birds... Typically, benzocaine in larger doses can be a little bit more toxic to birds. And so that's why I try to use it exclusively on things like the nails um, and on blood feathers. So very, very small things. So it's not going to hurt the follicle of the, of the feather, which was always my concern. Why not I was the flower and cornstarch by preference, usually. Yeah, I, I've i never seen that happen. Um, mm -hmm. I've never seen it hurt the follicle of the feather, typically because it's not direct. It's not the follicle I'm putting it on. It's kind of the broken bit of the blood feather, which is typically getting removed anyway. So I'm usually not putting it directly on the follicle. It's usually just on that broken piece of the blood feather to stop the bleeding long enough for me to, um, long enough for me to get it under control so I can remove it. And that's okay. what you can do at home too, is just put it at the, the the area where it's broken, but not necessarily the follicle. But definitely try to avoid anything internal and skin yep. preference. Okay. Yeah, preference. Yeah. I would, I would prefer people not place it on the skin. It's probably not the end of the world if it does happen to get in a wound, but I, it's probably not our best option. Right. It's not the best way to stop bleeding for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, in that case. Right. Um, and you were talking about, uh, like, a. um, uh, a place, a, a tank, you know, first aid kind of setting and, and heat. Do you recommend having the heat? This is a question from somebody, uh, a heat under only part of it so they can get out of it. Yes. And I'm glad that someone asked that because I realized a little too late. I forgot to mention that. Absolutely. We want birds to choice. Be yeah, exactly. So I say over a third to a half of it is typically good. Um, but yes, absolutely. I, that's a great question. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I always try to think choice in every situation, good and yes. bad, you know, so they can yes. make their own decisions. Uh, so to be able to thermoregulate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, somebody wanted to know if cream-based Neosporin was okay, I guess as a last resort. Ooh, that's a good I didn't question. Know there was cream-based. Yeah. I would look at the ingredients first is what I would say. I haven't looked at the ingredients of neosporin, I know, um, of cream-based neosporin specifically, um, but if it does not contain oil and you have literally nothing else and it is a superficial wound, maybe. Um, but that, the, the biggest thing I worry about neosporin is definitely the, um, the oils that it contains because it does contain quite a few, but if you see the word oil on the cream, I haven't read the, um, cream based neosporin label, but, um, but I know the traditional, like the, the, the main one, the one that I think of when you think about, when you think of neosporin, that one does contain a good bit of oil. Um, so I would just look at the label and make sure it doesn't contain oil. I still wouldn't really recommend doing it without calling your vet first or, um, or trying to get into a veterinarian because we may have better options for you, but, um, but in like last resort, no chance of getting the bird into a vet, probably mm -hmm. better than absolutely nothing. As long we as it's cream based oil. arnica, um, not on in the wound, but around the wound because it helps dissipate bruising and blood coagulating and all that and pain it's been yeah yeah exactly for myself as well yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um somebody wants to know how long does it take for something wrapped around the toe to cause problems i guess very it's fast height, right? <laughs> <laughs> very very fast um it depends on the size of the bird what's wrapped around the toe how tightly it's wrapped around the toe um, but it can happen very, very, very quickly. Um, usually it can happen in hours, honestly. Um, sometimes even an hour is enough to start seeing some of that swelling. 
Um, and something I forgot to mention during that and keeping in mind, um, something I like to keep in mind about the anatomy is there's not really any soft tissue. It's basically bone and skin. So when you have something wrapped around the toe, it can cause pressure necrosis or basically too much pressure and death of the um, periosteum, which is that part of the bone that contains blood flow. And so very, very quickly you can get death of that bone. And so, um, that becomes an issue where we sometimes need to amputate. So the answer, the, the real answer to that question is it can happen quickly within hours. Um, so that's why it's best to try to avoid all of the, those, that's why prevention was the first thing on that list. because so we want to prevent mm -hmm. that from happening as much as possible. And the biggest problem you find with leg bands is that they can get squeezed by- Not Oh. Yeah. So that's one of them. That's the most common way that I see constriction injuries, but I see other is issues with leg bands as well. Um, I've seen them get caught on things. And if you, but if I've seen, I've had a couple of cases where they've gotten caught on something and torqued it and a bird has actually broken their leg um, from that. Um, birds are sometimes irritated by them. I've had um, not just squeezing, but kind of like that xanthoma picture I mentioned, like if something is enlarged or if that bird has gout or any other condition that enlarges, the like that takes up that space below there, it starts to put pressure and necrosis on it. But um, but yes, I um, we had a split band just... Um, I didn't put the picture in the in because I had that other good one, but we had um, one of those that came in with the, leg, with the bands um, kind of like crushed over it from him biting mm -hmm. at it just last weekend actually wow yeah. how often do you still see the open bands for wild caught birds we always try to leave those on just yeah because. yeah and that's that's the difference that's that's yeah. one that, that's one that i i mean if if i will always remove a band if it's requested but um that's a little bit different because that's like a u that's one that the usda puts on so keep in mind that that is from um birds have not been able to be legally imported into the United States since 1992. Um, that was the last, that was when that, um, and I'm forgetting the name of that law. I keep on wanting to say Migratory Bird Act, but that's not it, it's something else. Um, but in 1992 was the last time birds were able to be imported through the pet trade um, or our pet parrots were able to be. So I'm seeing less and less of those because those birds are now um, in their thirties, but we do still see them occasionally like birds that are uh, like especially thing, you know, African greys, cockatoos, some of the ones, so, yeah some of the ones that do have those very long lifespans I still see have I still see their USDA bands mm -hmm. yeah I think they deserve the honor of being recognized as wild caughts for who they yeah. are yeah, yeah exactly every time I see one I'm just like oh that's so cool <laughs> yeah um someone wants to know if there is a non-invasive way to remove a wing tumor on an elderly cockatiel I would have to have more information. <laughs> what kind of tumor? Yeah. Would talk? yeah, there's so many tumors that can happen because there's the skin, um, there's the muscle, there's the bone, non-invasive. Ah, unfortunately, probably not. Typically when I see wing tumors on cockatiels and in birds, I do typically recommend wing amputation. And it really stinks because I know they get the wing tip tumors. I know most birds, when they get tumors, it's at the very, very tip. And we want to try to preserve as much as the wing as possible. It is hard. It is really hard to do a surgery on just the distal or further away aspect of the wing because there is no soft, there is no soft tissue to close over any remaining bone. There is very little stretch and give of that skin. So typically what's in oftentimes afterwards, they continue to traumatize that area. You can get um, tissue death, dehiscence. There's so many complications with those that sometimes you know, I really try to beg owners um, when I see those, just be like, he'll do fine with one wing. I know he can, <laughs> you know, it would be in his best interest and his healing will be so much faster. Um, but as far as I'm aware, you know, unless it's very, very small and you could do something like cryotherapy, if it's a very, very small wing tumor. And again, it depends on the type of tumor. Um, unfortunately, probably not. Usually with true tumors, we recommend excision. Yeah. We had an Amazon in Florida who came in with one under the wing that was literally as big as his head. <sighs> Dr. Stevenson worked a long time to remove yeah. that. Work. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's too much to take fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think about aloe vera use? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't used it very much. Most of the wound dressings I'm using are antimicrobial. Um, so 
I don't really use aloe vera. I'll be honest. Um, most of the wound dressings I use, I also trying to make sure that they're getting a, um, like an antibiotic and antimicrobial aspect to it. Hydrogel, uh, back to, back to me loving hydrogel. It's great because it does have antimicrobial properties, but it also has anti-inflammatory properties. And so you still get some of that soothing effect from it. Mm -hmm. About 25 years ago, Phoenix, my Phoenix green wing, uh, drank a bottle of tea tree oil. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and his vet at the time said to give aloe to like flush it out george's oh, aloe interesting very, just to yeah. move it out of the system you know but that yeah. was a pretty extreme situation that is yeah. pretty extreme i'm just like hot i can't imagine that that tasted good the tea tree no, oil. <laughs> I, know. I guess i you know curious yeah. was a positive attribute to a not so good situation right <laughs> um uh somebody wanted to know about a first aid kit uh kate this will be recorded and posted online and uh dr carruthers talked about that at the beginning um so that'll be a good place to go back and, and look at that um uh vetricin is for dogs and cats specifically so uh it won't say for birds but that's okay no and sometimes well the bottle that we get does actually have a picture of a little green bird on it um I think oh. yeah i can't remember what the bird is um but it does have a picture of a bird on it um, it's not, it's, it was developed for dogs and cats because that is the majority of the pet industry. Um, but, um, I use it for many species. Um, I use it a lot for, um, not bird specific, but I use it for rabbits that get urine scalding issues. Um, so I use it for multiple different species. The only species I use that I don't use it for as often are reptiles because SSD is usually better for their type of, their type of skin. And say what SSD is. Sorry, silver sulfadiazine. <laughs> yeah. It's more of a cream. It's uh, thicker. <laughs> right. In that fact, somebody wanted to even silver dur, silver dur. I don't know what that is. I only know silver dine. What was that? Uh, what about silver dur? She said she spells it S I L V A D U R. I I've not heard it said that it way. It might just be a different brand. I'm not sure, but it uh, um, but yeah, like um. But like colloidal silver is typically the active ingredient in it, um, which is antimicrobial. Um, but um, typically the the silver sulfadiazine cream, it's more of like a cream based. Um, so it's great for some of those deeper wounds, especially when you need it to penetrate deeper tissues like necrotic tissues and eschars, or which are basically just thick scabs. Um, it can penetrate all of that and it keeps that, it can, it lasts a lot longer than vetricin or any hydrogel ointment does. And so it can keep tissue that needs to be kept moist, moist for much longer. It's basically the consistency of a night cream. It's very like thick. Um, so it's great for areas where you need more moisture. Uh, I was going to ask you about colloidal silver. It was, you know, it's kind of big there for a while. I don't hear as much about it anymore, but can you use it directly as is? Um, I see people, I see people with chickens do that sometimes. Um, mm. we don't do a ton of that per, uh, at our clinic, but, um, but yes, <laughs> we just, we, um, I see a lot of people get, um, get those materials for a lot of their poultry. So it's not, it's not going to hurt them. No, no, it won't. It shouldn't, it shouldn't. No. Somebody wanted to know about using quick stop on a, on a wing tumor. If it's bleeding, I I think we already talked about that. that's not good on the skin. Yeah. Um, uh, some people there's better ways to deal with bleeding in that case. Right. There's, yeah. I usually, you can't, yeah. Like in an emergency situation, you know, it's like that, that's your best option. You're at home and you have a wing tumor and it's bleeding. That might be your best option. Um, but eventually, especially for those tumors. And I, I mean, I've, I've seen, I've definitely seen some xanthomas that bleed really, really badly where we've had to talk about, you know, using that. Um, I've used, um, um, gosh, forgetting the Chinese herb, um, but we have like a Chinese herb that's supposed to help with that stuff too, that you can use um, as well with bleeding. And I'm just blanking on the name right now, but um, eventually if you have a tumor that is bleeding, we really want to address the underlying cause of that bleeding. And that's something that I, you know, we talk about for all of these injuries, 
it's just a temporary solution, the quick stop. If you have a broken nail, you still have to deal with it. And usually that's when we're putting either the tissue glue or the um, acrylic or epoxy resin over it. If you have a broken beak, we still have to address that. If you have a broken blood feather, we still have to remove it. And unfortunately, if it's a tumor, I get it. If we were not going with surgery for other reasons, like I totally understand, but just keeping in mind that it's, you know, it, the quick stop is meant to be a temporary and quick, so, quick solution. <laughs> Uh, Laura just said you noon by Yao. Is yes, you noon by Yao. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's great. Um, I love it. Tell me all hard when you have like all of this information just bumping <laughs> around in your brain. I'm just like, where am I pulling this from? <laughs> I was like, but yes, we use you noon by Yao too. They have, when you get the capsules, they do have like a red capsule that's like the emergency capsule. And that stuff is great to use topically to stop bleeding. Ah. I know in homeopathy, if you can't stop bleeding, phosphorus is one of those, it will, st it yeah. will actually help pe save people's lives because it yeah. will stop. And you can, I think, I believe you can get silver nitrate sticks too, because we use that sometimes at our clinic as well. Um, and silver nitrate, it, it is a little, it's definitely more painful to quit stop because um, it does get cauterized, but um, it's a pretty safe and efficient way to get some cautery. If they really fast. Yeah. Yeah. It's fast. <laughs> It'll stain your skin and your nails <laughs> if you use it. Just be aware. <laughs> um, uh, sulfadiazine require prescription? No, no, not no, at all. Sulfadiazine does not require a prescription. Where where does one get that? You can get it from, um, you can get it online. Um, I believe through Amazon, Chewy, those websites. You can also, I believe you can get it from most, I've never tried to buy it from um, a pharmacy, but I believe they sell it at pharmacies as well. Mm, that's great. Um, is there any other thing that can break or? Oh my God, everything breaks. It's just like, <laughs> I'm like, how do we want to define break, right? <laughs> oh, uh, I, I know I was, I remember be, getting that topic and I was like, where do I start? <laughs> but I'm so um, glad you were willing to take it on. Oh my I gosh. Yes. I, I love a challenge. And it's always, like I mentioned, I can't emphasize enough how honored I am to be asked to do one of these and how much it means to me, how much I learn when I get to study and pour through the data to make these presentations. Um, it makes me a better doctor. And I love having an opportunity to give back to um, the pet parents who make jobs like mine possible and who are interested and nerdy about the same things I am. So just, again, I simply cannot thank you enough for this opportunity. Oh, I, I understand completely. It's a, it, when you have to talk about something, you have to actually learn about it and then it helps you remember it. And, yeah. but because you're, you're doing that for us, so many people are going to be able to refer back to this on Sunday night when something happens yeah. and <laughs> know what to do about it. Right. right. So Hey, gang out there, Dr. Crothers is willing to come back and do this again. What topic are you uh, really hungry to know more about? So, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I, have any I, ideas. I love yeah. I love making these and I'm happy. Give me a topic and I would love to I'd love to help you guys out with um, with anything you're interested in. Um, Even just having a and a is um, can be very helpful because everybody's got different issues. We can't you know, diagnose a problem and solve it in, with a purple pill online. But you yeah. know, it's a great opportunity that you're willing to give your time and to ask questions. And once again, if you are coming to the retreat, you can actually meet Dr. Carruthers in person and Please. enjoy the time <laughs> together. Yeah, we don't, you yes. know, they stay. I love, I love meeting people who love birds as much as I do. <laughs> yes. Well, you're renowned for your love of parrots. Um, so we are grateful for that so I tell a lot of people who make appointments there to ask for you specifically because uh, that, how makes, dedicated you that are. makes me so happy because of my day I love I love all my patients and I love all my clients so much but I if I could see all birds all day that would be the dream <laughs> ah well we can probably help more with that so yeah lots of birds um yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see if we have anything else. I know we've taken up a lot of your time. Oh, I'm uh, happy to help you out. I, I can, I'm, I've got nowhere to be. <laughs> uh, yeah. Common diseases, how to prevent and treat liver disease. Yeah. Those are very common ones. And again, if you could come to the retreat, we're going to talk about some of those things specifically, which is a, a great time to be together. And I'll and give you one word, diet. <laughs> diet. You know, that's diet. 
Oh, we're really gosh. big on diet too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nourish to flourish. That's my mantra. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I could talk about that for hours and hours. I won't. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, diet is preventing as far as disease prevent true disease prevention, diet is so everything. Essential. Yeah, it's everything. Yeah. And not just a bowl of pellets and walk away. It has oh to my be- gosh. No. Yeah. There's even for like mental health, like and incorporating foraging too. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I could talk about, we'll talk about it all day. There's so, yeah. Right. Definitely enriching the diet in multiple ways is important. Yes. Yeah. We'd all be bored if we just ate one thing or right? feel terrible <laughs> if we only ate pizza. Yeah. So. It's oh my really- God. Can you is imagine this little here that we're looking at? Is this your little guy? No, he, this is not mine. This is not mine. This was um actually, I'm glad you asked. He was my very, very first orthopedic patient. Um, we um really struggled to get he, he had came in for a fractured wing, and his presentation was he had just changed. He was suddenly a very, very angry bird. He was biting his owners all the time. He had been previously a very, very sweet bird, super talkative. Now he didn't want anything to do with his owners, and so it came in as a behavior consult. And on exam, I noticed his wing had severe contracture and deformity. Um, like when I, not until I extended it, cause it was up at the shoulder joint. Um, so we took x-rays and he had a non-union fracture. You could tell it had been trying to heal and it wasn't successful. And so he was just in a lot of pain and mm-hmm. I'll never forget. So, you know, unfortunately for him, the best, um, the best, um, the best solution was amputation. I always like to try to avoid amputation, obviously, but sometimes it really is the best answer. And that was the the case for him. Um, And I'll never forget when the owner, so he's my very first orthopedic surgery of any kind. And the owner came back and he was like, you've given me my bird back. And it was just the most meaningful thing anyone has ever told me. Like, it was just like this really, really sweet moment. We amputated his his wing, took away his pain. He healed beautifully. So you can't see it because he's kind of given you his good side. But um, the other wing, this was his recheck that he doesn't have the, um, he doesn't have the left wing. And he was back to his normal self singing and doing his normal things. (laughs) That's wonderful story. Chronic pain. I mean, who chronic can pain be- is the worst. <laughs> chronic pain. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's yeah it, we always suggest people when they say their bird changed to go make sure they go get a, a wellness check because you can't see yeah. what's wrong all the time. Yeah, exactly. There he was, he was showing that he was in pain and the only reason, and the only way that he could. Yeah. Like, don't touch me. Leave me alone. Don't touch me. It hurts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Help. Help. <laughs> Well, we're so grateful to, to you as always, and uh, we'll work on something maybe for this fall for you to come back. So I would love fun. that. Uh, please do. I would... disease and diet or something. Yeah. Yeah, please. Okay. I would be, I would be so thrilled. <laughs> okay, good. Well, start thinking what that would be and we'll make it happen. So thanks okay. again, everybody for being here. I hope Thank to you guys so much. join us again in March with the renowned Rosemary Lowe, who's just, you know, the most prolific writer uh, about parents in the world, frankly. And um, there's more knowledge in her head than I'll ever be able to acquire. So we're so glad she's been willing to share some of that with us. So um, March 16th, come back, please. And uh, the recording of this will be up later today. Uh, And as always, we're just very grateful and look forward to seeing you in a month or so. So here in Asheville. Yay. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Thank you guys again so much. I appreciate your time. Okay. Bye everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great weekend.